first time I heard it, and I was terrified. It was noon on a Tuesday in my first week in San Francisco, and there I was, 25 years old, soaking in the sun on a walk with my overpriced iced coffee in one hand. I was looking really cute, if I might add, in my white t-shirt and high-waist bell-bottom Levi black jeans that I bought at the local thrift store back in Boston just before I left to imitate the cool, hip, San Francisco woman I was trying to be. The heavy, trendy gold eyeshadow was, was also a nice touch, too. And the patchouli oil I dabbed on my wrist, which I bought at the hippie head shop, created a cloud of fragrance, an aura around me that announced to all, Emily has arrived. And she is the California it girl. And I was feeling on top of the world. So don't judge me. So strutting down Valencia Street, towards the heart of downtown, lost in the internal soundtrack of my own vibes, I was jolted out of myself by an intensely loud wailing that hauntingly droned and seemed to be coming from everywhere all at once. That can't be just a regular ambulance siren. Police siren? No, 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 no. This, this, is, this is not normal. My blood felt like it suddenly became ice in the 70 degree weather, and I panicked, running a few steps ahead of me and looking for the nearest alley to duck into, to hide from whatever ominous, unidentified thing it was that the siren was warning about. Disoriented and in my haste to take cover from the threat, I tripped in the alley and fell, tumbling into a puddle of spilled iced coffee and my dignity. After taking a minute to collect myself, I looked up out of the dark alley, and to my surprise, no one seemed to be phased at all. In fact, everyone looked unbothered and blissfully unaware, the Twitter tech bros marching on as if there wasn't an alarmingly menacing noise coming from the sky that sounded like a Cold War era siren that this millennial has only heard in PBS history specials. So, still a little bit shaky, partially from the noise and partially from my own embarrassment, I stood up and tried to gather myself from the pavement. My eyes teared up in humiliation, gold eyeshadow trailing down my cheeks, and behind me, in the alley, I heard a disembodied male voice chuckling and amused. You're not from here, are you, honey? The siren ended in another ghostly voice, coming as if from above the skyscrapers, confirmed, this is a test. This is a test of the outdoor emergency earthquake warning system. This is only a test. Well, now laughing at myself, wiping my eyes, the bubble of my panic burst, I answered back to the man, well, how'd you know I was the new girl in town? <laughs> Takes one to know one, he says. That's okay, dear. I'm not from here either. But you get used to it. It happens every week, that siren. You know, it's good you listen, though. Not a lot of people do. When the big one hits, you'll be ready for the real thing. Coming into view now, I can see he's a person who's lived on the streets. In this alley I've stumbled into is where he lives. It's his house. We pause for a moment, and seeing me shaken, he silently hands me a cigarette and leans in to light it, the flame illuminating the darkness of the alley like a gift, a beacon. Welcome to the city, sweetheart, he says. Welcome home. The gospel passage from Matthew we all read together, in a lot of ways, is like one big scriptural alarm bell that should cause us to consider what it is to practice, to prepare, to rehearse and be ready for the real thing. For that day and hour 
will not be every Tuesday at noon, like the San Francisco earthquake alarm. Our encounter with God, face to face, will happen at a time we least expect it. But about that day and hour, Jesus says, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Jesus reminds us that all of us, not even he, the Son of God, can pinpoint or control how the divine will show up to radically alter and confront each of us, to sweep us off our feet in a moment, humbled, surprised, and changed. In the season of Advent, which begins today, this scripture can read a little bit like a record scratch, an uncomfortable blip in the lectionary, like, why are we reading something seemingly about the rapture when we should be thinking about shepherds and sweet, tame little lambs at the infant baby Jesus' feet? As we sang earlier, oh, come, oh, come, oh, wait, wait a minute, what? <laughs> When we light the first of our four Advent candles, this one symbolizing hope, what does this scripture have to say about hope when it seems to only point to fear and danger? Well, the Greek word parousia that's used in our text, and well, I wouldn't be a good University of Chicago Divinity student if I didn't sprinkle in some New Testament Greek to help us out. The word parousia is a noun that means a coming a presence, or an arrival. As it's used in the New Testament, it can refer to any individual's coming to a specific place or to be with specific people. Historically, it's been associated with the second coming, and yes, that is one way to interpret this text for sure. But what if there's another layer here? Stay with me. What if perhaps Jesus is asking us to be awake to, alive to, not just the final moment of his coming, but to all the instances in which the divine, like a jolt in the earth, shakes us up and calls us to attention, to be ready and awake to partner with God in our midst, and to see his spirit in every moment just waiting to break in. You see, during Christmas, we celebrate God breaking into Mary's life and arriving unannounced. Although terrified and fearful, instead of shrinking away, Mary says, here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. She was kindled by God's spark. She was alive to God, awake to the possibility and promise inside of her to letting God burst into her world and radically re-envision it. Although she did not get to choose the hour or moment that the Spirit, the presence of God, descended upon her, she was open to the encounter, and inside her grew the possibility of hope, her hope, and our hope. She did not sleepwalk through her pregnancy, but eyes wide open, she looked to the future, holding her fear bravely and tenderly, while all around her others were looking to steal her joy, so that she could find no place to stay at the inn, no place to call home. Mary, on the run, in a violent, cruel, and still broken world. Friends, in this world, there are many thieves in the night that will seek to rob us of our treasures, to take away our joy. The lies that try to snatch from the cradle of our hearts all of the goodness that God promises us. The lie that we don't deserve to be truly seen or known. The lie that no one will catch us when we fall and mess up, even when we fall embarrassingly hard. The lie of scarcity that says there is not enough love for us. The lie of despair that whispers, no one cares or truly understands what you're going through. The lie of fear that tells us we can never truly be free. 
the lie that we don't matter, that we don't deserve to use our voices and take up space and demand justice, and the lie of futility that says the world can and will never change, so why bother trying? But what would it be like, friends, in the face of these thieves, these lies, which go by many other names, I'm sure you can name them in your head right now, to hold up a candle to them and actively cast them out, to partner with God and drag into the light these burglars that keep us from allowing the truth, the real truth, to get into our hearts, to startle the darkness with God's equally startling and improbable love. The good news is that as much of these, as these thieves are seeking to rob us of our shared inheritance, God is continually breaking in, if only we're awake at the door, ready to invite this and tend to these arrivals, these ruptures of the spirit, these moments of presence, of parousia. For do you hear the spirit speaking? It's knocking right now, if you just listen in. It can be vulnerable to open yourself to the promise of hope, but you can start every day by saying just a simple prayer. Lord, help me to not numb out, but to be awake to all you have for me. Help me to see you working in every moment of my life. It takes courage, but you may just begin to see, like Mary's belly growing miraculously, God working in and growing in your being, little by little by little. For there are many rumblings and breakings in of the spirit, birth pangs that come before the big one. So stay awake. And I want you to turn to your neighbor, really turn, and say it now. Stay awake. Stay awake. <laughs> if not, you will miss the beauty that is here all around us even as we see the despair and brokenness in our midst. For we can choose to stay awake and keep vigil for the visitors we want to let into our lives, into our world. Justice, peace, joy, love, acceptance, radical welcome. The Spirit is chasing after us relentlessly and is available to, available to us now and will be there for us at the end, friends. That is what Jesus promises. For one day, at one unsuspecting hour, there may be a brief moment of terror, and you fall on your face. But then a friendly stranger will break into your world and will offer you light in a city that is brand new to you, and as your tears turn golden as they run down your cheeks, you'll be welcomed home into eternal hope. Amen. <laughs>